how we work. So up above, there's a coarse filter and a fan, and it draws air in through that coarse filter. Then it blows the air out this way through that HEPA filter, which is mm -hmm. the spacey stuff you're seeing back there. And that gives you a, a sterile work, workspace because the air blowing over you is sterile. So if you come to work in the lab, the first thing I teach you is how to work with the sterile field. You have two forces. You have gravity. We still believe in it here for science. And you have the force there. So if you had a fungal spore, it would fall this way. So you work with your hands back here. You work with all sterile equipment, sterile media, sterile tubes, uh, tools. Uh, you have to wipe this down. You keep your surface sterile. We have autoclave sterile working surfaces to work on. And you, and you have like a tablecloth. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. And so uh, you maintain your sterility that way. So this becomes our our uh, sterile work. So it's just not like a cage or a glass thing or something. Well, if you were working with a very dangerous uh, human causing disease agent. Yeah. You would have a s different kind of cabinet. I'm only worried about not contaminating the cultures yeah, I work in. You don't want to blow viruses but, to everybody. But you don't want, yeah, exactly. So if you were working with viruses, you would be clothed up. You would have glass cabinet in front and you would have an air capture system. And you'd system. have the arm. And Maybe so, yeah, so, so depending on the level that you need to work with, uh, you would have different style cabinets. We don't need to worry about anything but keeping our Plants. our cultures uh, yeah. sterile. Yeah. Yeah. Walking into where, the, where I have the plants. Okay. And I have need for people. Unusual. So, so this is how we keep really dumb people out. We trip them and they fall on their face. So okay. what, <laughs> what's, what's with the wax? No wax. What's that? Oh. When you have contractors come in and wax your floor, you, they're not allowed oh. to come in here because this is where we have the Ooh, sterile. Ooh, I feel like I've just moved into a sci fi movie or something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, here's a bunch of hazelnuts. Okay. These hazelnuts were collected as uh, nuts in Azerbaijan. So, oh. so, somebody had gone collecting, they brought back nuts, but if you have hazelnut, nut, it doesn't keep, you know, you have a little embryo down in there that could grow into a new tree, but it dies really fast. So they had under sterile condition to excise that embryo, put it in a little vial and put it in liquid nitrogen, and then we brought that out and thought some of the plants in that seed lot and, and that's we grew them, them and, and this is orangey stuff at the moment. Yes, so the red media, most media, these are pears. So these pear trees are on clear. This is just the iron formulation that we use it turns the media uh, red. But the media has all the nutrients that plant needs to live on. It has all the sugars, it has all the salts, it has them formulated correctly to meet the individual plants growth needs, not each accession by genera. So each ex an accession would be like a title in the library. You may have multiple copies of that title, but that would be a, an, an example of an accession. Of so for uh, this accession, all of it came from one seed, because we're a clonal gene bank, oh, not wow. a seed gene so bank. You split it one seed, oh, okay. and we grew it up, and then you can grow as many Want. What's the next step for that? So the next step for this in my lab is going to be storage in a walk-in cooler. Okay, and that's in but the there's a, the no, and I'll show there. you in just a second. But there's other reasons to have them in these cultures. One is that the nursery industry, I don't know if you saw all the hazelnut trees planted everywhere, and you'll see more as you're driving to Eugene today. Um, all of those are new trees that came from the OSU hazelnut breeder, oh. uh, and uh, they have come as tissue culture that I propagated here, sent out to commercial propagators who propagated enough of 
Mind you, that's from one little hazelnut. So they're all identical. They're all identical. This is a clonal gene bank, so they, each accession is a clone. Uh, and then that's what the source for all of those orchards that have gone in. And, and those are pretty much new orchards right now because they have resistance to the fire blight. Okay. How, many, so. how many little sprouting things do you get from like one original? Is that the technical one, term? It just depends on how long. So little so sprouty, sprouty things. Little sprouty things. things. That's the technical <laughs> term. <laughs> well, you said you had to sprout them off of one nut. And right. Be and then at that so much, point, right? you can no. This goes indefinitely. Well, I mean, originally, like the first time you do it. Okay. So there's there's cycles. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the first time you have one little tree and it gets that big. Let's say that you had one of these, I know, I had just passed these, but some of these are pretty tall. Some place in here, I have some. See, they got really tall. Yeah. So, uh, and then I can take that tall branch and I can cut it as say, oh, I for these I cut it into three and then the next time they grow for a month yeah, then, I and I can do it again That's and I can do it again. Rhythm. I feel like I really want to get a hold of that growing medium. It works for use. us. It doesn't work for. I've tried spanning. No, no, no. I'm talking taller. about for, for, for plants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't need for plants because this seems to be like. Magic but you stone. have to keep it sterile and be able. But people do do home and tissue right culture. Kind of light and the right yeah, the, the right conditions and stuff. And our research over the years that I was working here was on formulating the media. Uh -huh. And hazelnuts were really hard. Um, the pear was the first thing we worked on and. The first media was developed in the 1960, and it was called Michigan's Goodness for carrot and, and tobacco culture, and, and it, it just they kind of got the basics of what the plant needed. But um, with new statistical modeling tools, we've been able to develop uh, manageable experimental designs that we can work on uh, varying all the salts at one time in relationship to one another. And uh, we found that, that the pears needed uh, an increase, like nitrogen, you give plants nitrogen, sure. right, to grow, but they need other things. And the, the things that are kind of in the medium level of requirements, calcium chloride, magnesium sulfate, and potassium phosphate, we, we doubled or more uh, in the media we found they needed. But when we got hazelnuts, that was much harder. Hazelnuts uh, were picky about the kind of nitrogen that you gave them, and uh, the um, uh, they needed boron, and the micronutrients became significant. And iron, so yeah, so they were they were pretty uh, uh, technical um, experiments to like get to the place where there's sort of a gelatin or something. There. Yes, there's auger on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. So, Magnifying and really I use sharp a microscope, tool. a good microscope, and very sharp tool. And steady hands. And then, and steady hands, no caffeine that day. It really <laughs> hurt. And uh, <laughs> then these, we hope, will have escaped the virus. Okay. So How will you know will, that they won't we die? We <laughs> will take them back out to the greenhouse and we will use appropriate mess, uh, methods for testing for the presence of that particular virus. So each virus is a little bit different. You have to grow them a little bigger than that though. Yes, I'm I'm working on getting, I'll get a box like this of them and then we'll get roots on them and, uh -huh. you know, and because plants growing in boxes are worthless. At some point, to be a real plant, they've got to go out to so the you real just world. Like cut the little, little square of the gel around. You the just plant. wash it off. And oh, just in the soil and oh, okay. yeah. But you know, in these environments, they haven't learned to do things like close their stomatas and all of that. So the transition between them. here to living in the real world. It's a tricky transition. So, and that's why you probably... But I don't do that transition. We have this magic person out in the greenhouse named Deborah. Um, who... Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she is able to guide these plants through in an amazing way, and I'm just in awe of her. Yes. So we store them in these bags and then have them go into dormancy and put them in the walk-in cooler. 
So that's where my 1,500 accessions are actually living, not here in the growth room. So when I put things in the refrigerator, just in like in, like herbs, like parsley or something, in a glass of water, it lasts quite a while in the refrigerator. Well, it's I? just a little cooler, but, but it's eventually not, it kind of yeah, you know, this it dies back. Different. Yeah, so what? Well, I've got temperature. So they've got nutrients. 40 degrees. Well, it's a refrigerator temperature. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Celsius. So, I think Celsius. <laughs> so it's, it's like 39 or something. 20. I think 20 for yeah. refrigerators. Oh, 32 is freezing. Yeah. 20 is freezing. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry. Most so, freezers so. are zero or 20 below zero. Yeah, I'm t talking refrigerator. Right for, though, yeah, right? the refrigerator. So, yeah, so they're you're up right. to 40. So 30, yeah, 40, 40 is the, the so high end safe zone. Yeah. I'm going to go. Dormant tea. So you got to trick them. You, you trick, trick them, them in into trick thinking clock, winter's yeah. coming, and then when they've got that week in the minus one degree, long night, cold, then we put them in the walk-in cooler, and we have a low level of light for a short 12-hour day, 12-hour night, okay. kind of thing in the walk-in cooler, and they have a little bit of nutrient, uh -huh. and then I just monitor so them. The, so they're basically in the same condition yeah. they would be because yeah. I always kind of thought like I've never thought about it very much but that plants to when they do the dormant thing they had to have had a certain amount of time in the other condition they do I think yeah it's more it's more the other way around they need a certain period of time in dormancy to be able well to yeah flower. I that. but I was just wondering so. like okay your plants that you just grow in your garden if if suddenly it decided to be like suddenly you stick your plants that you're growing like say it's the middle of summer or something in California and you said oh, I think I'm going to move to New Zealand this week and take my plants with me and all of a sudden it's winter they just died. They would they? just die. They yeah. need to be acclimated <laughs> into that a farmer grew a tree from. Uh -huh. Every delicious apple from then on came from cuttings from that tree. One tree, yeah. But if you went and collected seed out of a delicious apple. You'd never get a delicious you never know apple what you back. Have. You have no idea what yeah. you get because the particular combination of genes have been put together to give you a unique plant. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to keep collections as living plants. Who's got avocados? Yeah, I was just going to ask that. Would that be with the? Would that would be with? Because like the, the Haas avocado, avocado at least Davis, the um, but I'm not sure. The, the at least the story about the Haas avocado was it was a sport. It wasn't yeah. even a, a yes, a seed yes. Plant. And yes. then you need to yeah, you maintain that. And, and he cloned it off of a branch that was the one that had the good yeah, avocados. Avocados from a seed, plants you're never are, going to get plants something Plants are that tastes very like that interesting, one. even living plants because you can have chimeras so you'll have a sport off this different you know so so there's there's some variation that can occur and one of the things that we need to be very careful of is that we maintain that genetic correctness mm -hmm. in the cultures that we're growing and in tissue culture uh, we need to be especially careful and not regrow a plant from something that has gotten callousy not give it too much plant growth regulator to you know, kind of might mutate it or something. Or yeah, some yeah. Like they, you don't want. Yeah, yeah, you don't want some. So you have to know what it is before you can make sure that it stays that way, right? And like, yeah, like you so have to know the processes. To I don't know every single plant like, but they have to here, be able but to I test know the it. process of, yeah. of uh, determining what's there. Repository, and because we have so many different plants here, and want to maintain our collections and compare them to collections around the world, we um, do a variety of things to do that on a genetic level. Um, one of the things that we do is we develop DNA fingerprinting sets. Oh, oh, Just nice. like every person has a fingerprint, every plant hopefully has a uh, unique genetic <laughs> fin fingerprint given by mostly SSR markers is what we use. And um, they show up in these peaks. And so we design primers, and then we combine those primers together, which are just little segments of DNA that amplify a part of the plant's DNA. And uh, we compare different plants to each other, and we find out how they're different. And then sometimes it ends up that we thought two plants were different, but they're actually the same. Mm. So then we mm. use that to curate the collection and to verify that what we think is one plant here, they also think that's the same plant in France. So we get samples from all over the oh, world fascinating. and we exchange genetics and material to make sure that all the, collection, all the collections are uh, correct. Oh, we're all on the same page. Yeah. 
So, uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but these two, I think this example is saying that, do you remember what this example was saying? Yeah, so this okay. is um, a fingerprinting set. It's my most favorite fingerprinting set. Aww. I was able to get 14 separate markers into one reaction. Mm -hmm. So that is actually the largest fingerprinting set that we have. It is for Coralis, which is hazelnut. Go ahead. Which also happens to be my favorite nut. Mm -hmm. And because it's diploid, it's one of my favorite props to work with. <laughs> <laughs> um, those Fregaria and those blackberries, when they start getting all that extra ploidy going, get mm -hmm. real complicated and mm -hmm. uh, just, just so complicated. But, but we do it anyway. So um, SSRs, um, I'm not sure if you're from, how familiar you are with the, the molecular terms, but they're short segment repeats. So um, like here on this poster, um, AAG, is um, it's a trinucleotide repeat, and when that is repeated several times next to each other, it forms what's called a microsatellite, and SSR is a type of microsatellite. And so um, you get these places in the genome where you have these short segment repeats, um, and sometimes they can be associated with um, traits of interest, and sometimes they're just random throughout and, and aren't attached to anything. We do um, some work where the SSRs are attached to um, genes of interest like uh, resistance to different diseases or, or um, insects, that kind of thing. So, um, but when you amplify one portion of the genome, then you have like a bunch of blueberries and they're all the same. They all have the same peak. So, like they all have that 280 peak. So then you add another SSR to it, another place in the genome that is amplified, and then it exponentially changes the, um, the number that's going to have both of those. So then you have um, this one that has the 274. So, um, and this one doesn't have the 274. So, and actually, it's probably more, um, each color here, so this is one SSR that amplified a segment that was 105 and 108 base pairs. And in this one, only the 105 showed up. So, right there, they're different. So, they, and these are varieties. Yes, yeah, so okay. Jim and Dundee are um, cultivars, is what they call okay. the named varieties. Right, right, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, my background's in marsupial immunology, so <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> <laughs> Vaccinate koalas yeah. or something? Yeah, um, <laughs> actually I worked on uh, monotremes and oh, the... the things, right? Yeah, well, the tachyglossus, which is the echidna, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, okay. Um, echidnas, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. and the brush tail possum. <laughs> so, Aww. yeah, they're very cute. <laughs> Not, but the, the Coralus can be cute too. <laughs> I think blueberries are adorable. The, they can be. Especially yeah. in my tummy. Especially, yeah, yes. anywhere between here. Definitely, and... <laughs> definitely. So, um, we use this information also to um, make these fun uh, phylogenetic trees. Ah. And so, what this, um, after fingerprinting um, the collection that we have, um, it, they were, they broke up into certain groups and they actually fell out really nicely. Like, it's really neat when they do what they're supposed to. Yes. <laughs> so this is how they're related to each other, kind of? Yeah, um, and like all of these are found in, um, are part of the English and the Italian Spanish. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So. Wow. Huh. Yeah. And that's how they're related to each other. And this is a, a harder way to see a tree, but um, these these are actually branches. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
And those are the 300 varieties or whatever that you're yeah. talking about? <laughs> strawberries. We, we have the stuff. I was wondering if you happen to know Kevin Falta. Oh yeah, we work with him all the time. He's the best. He's the <laughs> best. Do it with a straight face now. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Tape. How many, take, how many takes is that now? Tape 15. Okay. Do it again. Kevin Falta is the best. <laughs> <laughs> he works on Strawberries. Fragaria. Fragaria. <laughs> Kevin, this is for you. I don't. I give I give the Fragarias to the to everybody else because they've got the octopoids. <laughs> they've got the who? Octopoids. Multiple Octopoids. combinations of different numbers of chromosomes gotcha, gotcha. I, I just that get hear. very complex. I, that's, that's like, why would octopi Way be too much, <laughs> yeah, way too much fun on a Saturday afternoon. Actually, Susan, you're looking straight across to Jill's uh, office. Is that bad? Oh, no. Kevin, Kevin knows Jill. Oh, Where I thought happened? maybe maybe people on the screen would probably be able to zoom in on it, and there's some very amazing technical stuff in there. Sure. On her screen, and now there there's somebody going to go clean it now. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, Kevin, that was for you. If it fits, it's, yeah, if it fits, then get in. This is the what topical we greenhouse. Our vaccinium from, well, these are from Nepal, but we also have uh, vaccinium is blueberry relatives. Did you so grow these? These were collect. I didn't grow these. I, I have no idea what to do with living plants. <laughs> okay, so, if it, so the whole plant was given like a regular nursery. And maybe they from. collected the seed. Maybe they, they didn't go to a nursery. Somebody went to Nepal and collected that. Oh. So there's a bunch from uh, the volcanoes in Hawaii. Um, and that's a blueberry relative that has thorns. This is vaccinia. So it's, it's, there's a lot of species in vaccinia. There's, there's many, many species. What's the next thing that's going to happen with this plant? It's probably it will dry and get water. Look it like lives it here. Lots of cutting so our, uh, yeah. maybe, they, maybe they, they needed or somebody requested it. But these are the living uh, collections that we're preserving. So the this is like a library. What's the next thing that happens to a book? Somebody checks maybe it out. It just sits on the shelf, or, or maybe somebody wants to read it. Well, is it. someone going to take it to like a photo photocopier and make some? Uh, no, Susan <laughs> might photograph it. That might be the next exciting it looks thing. Like things have been but clipped off of but it, right? yes, so maybe cuttings were taken, and Missy is shipping a cutting out to somebody who wanted that plant. Uh, maybe nothing will. Maybe it will just sit here, and its unique genes are available if somebody needs it. Jim knows all about these these plants. I know nothing. I'm making it up as I know. I was going to ask if those plants by your house were coral bells, and I probably wouldn't have known. I probably wouldn't have known. It. <laughs> Tell them what you're doing. It didn't have any stalks in the front, but they had leaves and so could be. <laughs> yeah, that's about where, where I was too. Could they could be. So yeah, we have all this weird vaccinium here. These are all? Oh, actually Jim's the vaccinium manager. Everything so he knows right vaccinium. Or maybe those two. So I, I don't know which ones are. These are kind of cool, the Hawaiian ones here on the end. They didn't like what I did to them, but this, <laughs> these guys on the end here, those little fruits. What did you do to them that they didn't like? I put them in a soil mix. That, and are there typically orange blueberries? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yellow, orange, they get a little red. Yeah. And they like to get this nice coloring. And yeah, the leaves are red. And, uh, but this is gorgeous. Yeah. Really Do you have some that so came off of that blue. volcano that blew up? That the maybe. Well, one of these, one of these, uh, this is from the. These are both from Kilauea. I've uh -huh. seen wow. those. And the charcoal is just for the soil. You know, maybe they want some lava. Um, lava. The charcoal's in there, maybe. <laughs> so charcoal's my 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 chunk. It's barred. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> You're safe in the aisles. It gets a little crazy. Wow, it's wild and crazy here. Look at this.